Well, my wife and I moved into our house in Stone uh, in August 2020, just over three years ago when I retired. Uh, we, um, we'd already seen the property, but uh, when we got there, well, we were a bit kind of taken aback by the garden. Uh, it had shrubs all around it. I'll just explain. The garden has got a very large patio, the full width of the house, a very big patio. So what's left of the, of the garden is around about, in total, about 30, 35 feet wide. And uh, down the sides up to the patio is about 15 or 16 feet. So that's the kind of size garden. But, uh, when we moved in, there were shrubs all around the sides that had grown to a depth of, of at least six or seven feet. They were just spilling out everywhere. It was dense. It was, well, it was a mess. And we, and we started cutting it back. And, uh, and then you cut back a bit further and a bit further until you ended up with what looks like dead wood um, in, in, all, in, in a right knot. And you think this is never going to be shaped into anything good. You know, it's just too overgrown. So we ripped it all out. We ripped it all out and started from scratch. And it's honest, it's it's, it is honest. Down the one side, in the, in the first three or four months that we were there, I was on my hands and knees building raised beds. We got uh, vegetable beds down one side. We got a flower bed down the other side with shrubs and all kinds. It's, it's lovely. Trust me. I'm a vicar. As, as, uh, as, but, and then across, across the bottom of the garden, we, we got this huge bed with, with these, um, well, what they call these um, sleepers, railway sleepers. Huge bed. We'll make it a fruit bed. We put in a plum tree, a pear tree, an apple tree, a crab apple, blackberry, blackberries, and red currants. Wow. I've been looking for a crab. We've had one apple. <laughs> and that was in 2021. <laughs> one apple. Where we are, the, the apple tree has grown and it just catches the wind virtually from the, from the, um, from the Irish Sea. So it just comes straight through over the Cheshire Plain straight onto our garden. I'm sure it does. Could be one of the highest points that, of this housing estate where we live. Uh, one of the highest points. And the wind just catches this apple tree. And you can see it shivering. You can see you can see it going, oh, I'm bitter cold here. I don't like this. The leaves are just shriveled up. You know, you, we get we get blossom and that comes out in kind of March, April time. And we are thinking, it's going to frost tonight. We go out with the fleece. We put the fleece round it. We, we look after this apple tree. We get the blossom. And we get some apples on the blossom. It's great. They grow to about our size. And then they drop off because, because the, the wind is we're going, oh, I can't cope with this. And, and it just isn't doing very well at all. It's, I went looking for some fruit and found me. I think the apple tree is going to go this autumn. I do, honestly. But that's the point that I was making. It's exactly the point. Seeing God's relationship with Israel, God saying, You're my vine, you're the vineyard, and you're looking for fruit. We haven't found any. We haven't found any. 
very clearly this picture of the vineyard and God looking for fruit is is a kind of a metaphor, a, a word picture. You know, God God isn't really looking for grapes. You know, well, what he's looking for is uh, is the fruit that comes from Israel's faithfulness to the Lord and the prophets. That God uh, is looking for his people's faithfulness to God's will and purpose revealed to them through the law and the prophets. He's looking for justice and righteousness. That's what Isaiah said. Let me just read it to you in, in chapter 5, verse 7, what, we, what we've uh, read this morning. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his vines. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed. Looked for righteousness, but heard a cry of distress. God's not looking for grapes. He's looking for, for that kind of fruitfulness that comes from being in, uh, faithful to his will and his purpose. And because when God's looking for that kind of fruit, and finds it, it's all bad. He said, oh, I'll, just, I'll just get rid of it. I'll just get rid of this from you. I'll get rid of this from you. He foretells the, the forthcoming exile to Babylon. Now, inhabitants of Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll remove its head, it shall be devoured. I'll break down its wall, it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. The exile and all because they've been faithless in producing the fruit that God was looking for. By the time Jesus comes onto the scene, uh, some uh, kind of five, nigh on six centuries later, when Jesus comes on, he draws on that very prophecy from Isaiah. He, he, he may have made the connection in Isaiah. Isaiah, just wrong. Isaiah talks about, um, my beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill, he cleared it of stones, he planted it with choice vines, he built a watchtower and made a wine press, a wine vat. Jesus in his parable, he says, now, there's a landowner who planted a vineyard, he dug a wine press, built a watchtower. Those who were listening, the, the Pharisees and the priests and the teachers of the law, they would have known exactly this was about Isaiah's vision. They would have known exactly it was about uh, what Isaiah was prophesying. And the owner of the vineyard in the parable, uh, he, um, he hires it out to tenants uh, to, uh, to tend it and to, to grow the crops. And uh, in due course, he sends servants to harvest the crop. The tenants kill the servants. The tenants kill the servants. So the master sends his own son. I respect my son. And they kill the son. They kill the son as well. Jesus is referring this parable to himself. I am the son that God sent to his woman to, to find a fruit. I am the son. And then he makes this startling point. Amazing. 
The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. So, do you take on kill will become the cornerstone? On Jesus, on this cornerstone, will be built a whole new community. A community that will bear the fruit of the kingdom. I don't know if you caught the very last bit of the reading of the parable of God, what Jesus said about it. Listen to this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, the Pharisees and the priests and the teachers of the law. The kingdom will be taken from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of his kingdom. Wow. Wow. The cornerstone the, on which is going to be built this new community that will produce the fruit of the kingdom. Well, what, we might ask, is the fruit of the kingdom? What, what does that look like? Well, Isaiah gives us a, a bit of a hint. Oops. Isaiah says this, that, uh, you know, I, I came, God came, to his vineyard, looking for justice. He found only bloodshed. Came looking for righteousness, but found only cries of distress. Justice and righteousness. They're the, the kind of signs, the, the values of God's kingdom. That's the fruit of God's kingdom. You know, and when we think about that, um, you know, Isaiah referring to God looking for justice and righteousness, you know, we could say that that's the fruit of the kingdom and that fruit reflects the value of the kingdom. But we can, we can also add kind of things. Yes, justice, yes, righteousness, but, but also we can add um, mercy. And truth and faithfulness and grace, compassion, unconditional love. Those are the values of God's kingdom. And Isaiah speaks to the nation, to the whole community, the whole community of Israel. He looks for fruitfulness in the community of his people. Now, when we reflect on that, you know, we may hear God's call to us as his church, as, as God's people, God's, this new community that Jesus knits together by his spirit. God's call to us to be that community that's marked by and known for its justice, its righteousness, its mercy, its compassion, and so on and so forth. Now, who wouldn't want to belong to a community that's marked by love and truth and fairness, where no one's abused, where no one's cheated, where everyone's honoured from the youngest to the oldest, where you know, the younger, the young flourish and the, the aged are honoured. Who wouldn't want to belong to a community like that? You know, you are signs of that community. You, you, can be, you can be fruitful as a community to show those signs. And, um, and my guess is, is that the fruit of the community arises from the sum of the parts of its people. You know, that if, if you're all being faithful, the church will be faithful. 
Do you see what I mean? You know, the, the, the fruitfulness of the community is, is the sum of the fruitfulness of all the individual fruits, the vines, the branches. You are God's vineyard, is it there? God's vine, is it there? A community planted here. Oh, wow. Oh, just, just let that sink in. You are God's people planted here. And you'll be looking for fruit. But this is, this is, this is the great bit. I'm leaving the great bit till the end. Yes, we, you know, you can make your fruitful contribution to, to the life of this community. I pray that so. But, but I can't get away from what Jesus says in John's Gospel, and it's there in the fear of your church. And in John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am your vine. Now, Isaiah said in, in our reading, let me read it to you. The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his vines. No more. Jesus comes and says, I am the vine. I am this new Israel. I am the new community that, uh, that God is building. I am. I am this new community that bears the fruit of the kingdom of God. But then it goes on. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Abide in me, and you will bear much fruit. This is just a beautiful picture of God's goodness. You see, what's beautiful about it is God, he not only looks for fruitfulness in our lives, but he provides the way to produce it. All we have to do is abide. That's all we have to do. Abide in Christ. There's no, there's no striving here. It's all about abiding in him, making him the center, and he will mold us, and he'll shape us. It's that picture of pruning the vine that's there in John 15. Pruning the branches to make them more fruitful. But, uh, and we abide in him, he mold us, and he'll shape us. He does it by his spirit. And I want to finish, leave this with you. That abiding in Christ involves prayer. We bring in prayer all the ups and downs the joys and sorrows that we all face and we bring them to be met with his love and his grace that we know this in faith. we abide in christ by reflecting on scripture it's in scripture that we discover the heart the ways and purpose of god and we seek to be moulded according to God's heart. And when we seek that, by God's Spirit, we will mould us to reflect God's heart. We abide in Christ in communion. Now, it's an absolute mystery what we're going to do this morning. It, it's an, I, I can't explain it. But we are sharing in the body and blood of Christ. I, can't, I mean, it's bread and it's wine, it is. 
that we share in, in the body and blood of Christ our God. And, and it's a mystery. But when we do this prayerfully, and, and, and as Paul in his letter to the Corinthians encourages us to, as we discern the body and blood in this bread and wine, we're actually feeding on Christ. And we're, and, and we're kind of wanting his life to come and be renewed in us, that he would come and live in us. And we would live in him, that's one of the prayers we say at communion. He would live in us and we in him. And as he lives in us, as that life is renewed in us, we shaped and we molded into his witness. And abiding in Christ is being filled with the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. He's the agent that works in us. It's just mold us more and more into the likeness of Christ. And as we molded, as we shaped, and we bear fruit, we will bear the fruit of the kingdom. All of those values, all of those values we can see. Justice, righteousness, grace, mercy, and so on and so forth. They will be there in your life in abundance. So, this is what I say to you. May you be faithful in the Bible in Christ. May you hunger and thirst for God's heart and words, may we be much fruit, fruit of his kingdom, in this place. Amen.